we thought we'd start the year like we normally do this, just a little introduction to what the Florida Coastal Everglades Long-Term Ecological Research Program is about, especially for new people, but everybody's always welcome. And as I said, we are going to record this so that um, we can put it online and, and folks can dip into it as they need for you know any kind of information that you might want to find out about. So. Um, there are a few things that we wanted to talk about. Um, one is just what is the science of this program all about and how do each of you envision fitting yourselves into it, right? Um, so I'll give a little overview of where we are as a program and, and you know, in terms of the science that we do. Um, we'll also have some time for uh, the staff of the program to uh, introduce a little bit more about what um, their respective uh, roles are about and how they help you and the program throughout your degree programs. And um, John is there on uh, the, um, I think this is called Blue Jeans, it's our new technology for doing these things. And he's going to talk about the LTR network and what it means to be a uh, long term ecological research site in the context of a program that has 28 sites throughout the United States and, and um, in Antarctica and over in French Polynesia, uh, funded by the National Science Foundation. Okay, great. Hey, y'all. Um, my name is John Kamenowski, and I'm co-PI of the Florida Coastal Everglades LTR, and I'm an ecosystem ecologist and a biogeochemist, and I did my PhD at University of Georgia um, and studied did my PhD research, dissertation research at Coweta Long-Term Ecological Research uh, site in the Southern Appalachians. So um, what I want to talk to you about is the important, sort of the, the vast history of, of our four-year-old network and sort of where the roots of it come from. Um, tell you a little bit about where I think the network is headed and encourage you to take part in the network as a student and or postdoc um, and uh, kind of give you some examples of where uh, the um, opportunities for engagement across, across sites and throughout the network are possible and really rewarding and, and something that you should take advantage of. So um, I, for those of you that are not familiar with what the network is, um, as Evelyn said, it's uh, a, a grouping of uh, 28 long-term ecological research sites, um, but it's really important to know that the United States has an LTER network, and many other countries throughout the world have a network as well. We call it the International Long-Term Ecological Research Network. Um, I, I guess ours was somewhat of the first, um, and we've helped shepherd in other, other countries' networks. But there are, at one point, I counted over 832 long-term ecological research sites that have registered with the ILTER. So it's um, there's it's safe to say that there's over you know a thousand LTER sites probably, um, and we like to talk about it in terms of capital LTER. So we refer to ourselves as capital LTER but there are lowercase LTER. You might be working or know colleagues that do long-term research that are not part of the capital LTER network, but they're still LTER. I just wanted to clarify that. Um, but the roots of the capital LTER network, the US LTER network, go back to actually before 1980s. Yeah. Um, 1980 was when um, we formed the, the network through the National Science Foundation, but um, it was actually in the, uh, I believe it was the late 60s, early 70s, um, which was the uh, IBP, which was called the International Biological Program. And the International Biological Program was mostly um, conducted in North America and Europe, but it was like a rapid, it was sort of like a rapid biological inventory of systems, of ecosystems. And it got the world really excited about understanding ecosystems. 
um, at a global scale for probably the first time. Um, and from that, we have our network. And so if you go to the LTR, go LT, ltrnet.edu and go under network, if you go under history, there's a really interesting timeline of our network. So if you look here um, at the sites that are color coded by different biomes and from 1980 uh, all the way to the present, you can see that sites like Andrews Forest, which is out in, in the coastal rainforest of Oregon, and Coweta, which was a site there in the Southern Alps where I did my research, Conza Prairie in Kansas, Niwot Ridge uh, in Colorado, and North Tempered Lakes, um, which is up in Wisconsin. Those were the first uh, of the LTR sites um, that started in 1980 and have continued. And um, if you go to all the way down to 2000, you can start to see where there's more coastal sites that have come online. Palm Island Ecosystem, which is up in Massachusetts. Clerk, River Glades, us. Um, Georgia Coastal Ecosystems, which we often refer to as Georgia Coastal Everglades by accident. Um, Santa Barbara Coastal in California. There's lots of coastal sites that have um, started more recently in the network's history. And then several open water sites for the first time. Buford Lagoons Ecosystem way up in the north slope of Alaska. Uh, Northeast U.S. Shelf, which is um, uh, Maryland, off the coast of Maryland, Virginia area, um, or actually I think more close to Rhode Island. Um, and then North Gulf of Alaska, which is up in the, in the Gulf of Alaska. And you can see that there is this trend, just by looking at this timeline of the U.S. LTR network, where we've moved ecosystem ecology and long-term studies from the land to the coast and out into open water. And when I say from the land, I mean freshwater and terrestrial uh, systems. So I think that alone is an interesting um, timeline for us to think about. Um, and peppered in there are some other sites like uh, Central Arizona Phoenix and Baltimore urban LTDR sites. Kellogg Biological Station, which is, a, is an agricultural focused uh, LTDR. Um, and then our network communications and network office and data information management um, and communications. So spend some time with this website and the, the, the long term <coughs> history of it. I mean, the history of the long-term network, I think, is quite interesting. Um, and if I had to advise you on two things, I would say uh, pick up from the library or from the Amazon two copy, two books. One is called The History of the Ecosystem Concept by Frank Golly, and I think that was written in 1996. And that really tells the story of the origins of ecosystem science and networks, and um, and really the history of the ecosystem concept itself, which is pretty cool. And then the second book is called Big Ecology by Dave Coleman, um, and that is more LTER focused, but sort of picks up where Frank's book leaves off. Um, okay, so if you are new to the LTER, you're probably wondering where your research fits in. And it's important to know that students are the center of the LTER. Like, y'all are the heart of the research that we do. You come up with some of the most important ideas and, tr and, and actually carry out the work. Um, one of the things that I found when I was, I was raised in the network as a student and, and clung to it as a postdoc, um, I found that it was really hard for students to stay connected to the network while they were in their individual sites and hard to stay connected to the network once they graduated. Um, and I really encourage you to try to 
stay connected in both cases. So you're at FCE, it's a huge LTER site, it's very dynamic, there's lots of systems that we study, but it, it's one system, albeit a very complicated and large one. And so it really is important for you to read literature from other sites, from other research from other LTER sites and other lowercase LTR sites. Um, it's really important for you to understand the context of your work in a broader context of other people's work as a student. And while you're doing that, some of the easiest ways to learn is by using, um, by, by going to meetings where you can um, begin to share and learn from other people's data and, and begin to ask questions that might involve the shared use of other people's data through collaboration. So um, if we go back to the main web page, um, these all scientist meetings, uh, one that's coming up here at the end of September, beginning of October, are wonderful opportunities for you to learn about the NET network. Um, the meeting is jam-packed with science from different systems, and a lot of it is student-led. Um, there's a day uh, prior to the, the main um, schedule, I'll go to the schedule now actually, um, there's a day devoted to graduate students and it's usually the first day, so usually on Sunday. Um, yeah, graduate representatives pre-meeting and then I guess that's that. So it must be, that's led by Paul Julian and Sid Hart is your grad uh, network representative. Um, Paul was the uh, grad rep for, for FCE, and um, Luke is now your grad rep for FCE. Is, is that right, Luke? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's going to so, um, we'll probably be at that meeting, but uh, yeah. I didn't quite hear you, but I'll take your word for it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> There's a little bit of feedback. But, um, Get with Luke um, to see how you can be part of the grad reps uh, meeting, pre-meeting. They're calling it a pre-meeting because it's occurring before the, the main all scientists meeting. But during that meeting, I remember my first uh, all scientists meeting in 2006, and it's where I learned to think differently than I had been thinking. It's where I met a whole bunch of people, some of whom are my colleagues still. Um, and it was where, in times when I was in a postdoc where I wasn't actually affiliated with an FBDR, that I was able to maintain a connection to the LTR network because I was using data from the LTR network to do research with, with other collaborators. So um, check out the network webpage, check out um, Check out the, the All Sciences Meeting webpage and contact your grad rep for any questions on how to be more involved. But um, I'll lastly just end with uh, just an overview of the sites. So it's important to know that we are not representing all of the Earth in, in our network, but we're representing sites that are um, of biomes, of all of Earth's biomes, actually. Um, and so if you just look at this map, you know, we've got sites in Antarctica, we've got sites in uh, the Pacific, we've got now four sites in Alaska, um, a lot of sites throughout the coastal United States and interior United States. There's some big missing gaps um, from this network principally the Gulf Coast um, and Central Plains, except for Consul Prairie. But there's a lot that you can add to, um, if your work is at FCE or if it is outside of FCE, um, you have a lot that you can contribute through the network um, by being educated about the research that we do at FCE and the research that is done by other graduate students, postdocs, PIs, at other LTR sites, both capital and lowercase LTR. Um, 
I'll just end with one one last thing, which um, is well, two things: um, how we are organized as a network and why this is important. There are core research areas. Um, there are principally five, but if you are at an urban site, or if you're, so if you're with CAP, that's Arizona Phoenix, Baltimore Ecosystem Study, or Kellogg Biological Station, you have uh, seven core areas. But I'm just gonna focus on the five. Primary production, population studies, movement of organic matter, movement of inorganic matter, and disturbance patterns. And these are things research themes or areas that all LCDR sites collect data on. And so um, at the last All Scientists meeting in 2015, um, I co-led with Stuart Pickett um, a, a very broad workshop about ecological theory and the importance of long-term ecological research. And it ended up that at the same time unbeknownst to Evelyn and I and Sarah Baer, who ended up being co-authors on a paper, there was a group of folks at Arizona State University who were also interested in developing um, an analysis of how LTER science has used a certain theory. And that theory is actually a suite of theories. It's the theory of ecosystem development that uh, Eugene Odom pioneered in 1969. And um, we extended it through a lot of hard work and reading of a lot of different papers from across the network. And we put out this paper, and in tandem, uh, Jessica Corman, who was at North Temperate Lakes um, and also did work at CAP, Central Arizona Phoenix, um, she, she's about to publish a meta-analysis that looks at how often and in what ways Odom's classic paper from Science 1969, how it's supported through the literature or not. And so if you go into this paper, what we did is we pulled out the ecosystem attributes of Odom and where they lie within the LTR core research areas. And there were these predictions by Odom of developing and mature system types. And we argued in this paper that there are also systems that are in decline. And so um, we might not always expect um, a system to develop towards an equilibrium or stable pulse stability endpoint, which is what Odom predicted. Um, and instead, we may have systems that may continue to develop a, a trajectory through time um, or decline in, in, in a trajectory that's either rapid or gradual. And that we really can't understand these things without understanding or having long-term ecological research. And that we really can't generalize about them without a network approach to understanding our site as well as understanding many other sites. I know I went over, um, but I'm kind of passionate about this, and um, I hope to see many of you around campus and at the ASM and at our own ASM next May, and just keep doing great work and have fun. Thank you so much, Dan. Yeah, thank you. That was fantastic. So helpful to hear the perspective, and always a great reminder for all of us that we're um, part of something bigger, right? And uh, that there are just so many opportunities out there. Uh, one of the um, aspects I just want to add is that um, every so often this network communications office, which is based over in um, Santa Barbara, California, um, that helps us kind of coordinate activities like the All Scientists Meeting. Um, they have these opportunities for synthesis projects um, in addition to like the ASF All Scientist meeting that John mentioned that also has all these um, different workshops where you can get ideas rolling across sites and, and have products like a paper that you mentioned. Um, they also come up with these opportunities every so often for um, graduate students to come in and lead 
um, different kinds of synthesis efforts. And we've had um, several students from our program take that on. Uh, Ross Luchad was one of them. He was a student in um, Jen Rehage's lab and uh, decided to do a synthesis project about the movement behaviors of consumers across different LTER sites, and there's a publication coming out about that. Um, there's another paper that here, a whole series of papers and a special issue um, that he led throughout, um, you know, leading folks throughout the network on the importance of um, cold snaps, cold events like we occasionally have and some tropical habitats. So, you know, there's just these really neat opportunities that come from being a part of a network, um, and so we need to keep our eyes open for uh, the network communications offices and announcements for, um, for, for those, especially as you're getting along through your, um, perhaps your dissertation work and, and find these opportunities for learning outside of your research domain, um, you know, possible and exciting and, and fitting for that next stage of your work. So, um, let me just grab, oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, I just want to spend a few minutes talking about um, our Florida Coastal Everglades LTR program. So, uh, we've been around, as John said, for about 20 years. We um, have a lot of different um, universities collaborating with us, so uh, 29 other institutions, and some of those folks from the other sites are um, the people you're seeing on the video there. Um, so it's really a wonderful uh, collaborative network with uh, folks working on the Everglades from lots of different places, um, around, mainly around the U.S. We also are really dependent on agency collaborators, so we have a lot of uh, scientists, of course, studying the Everglades to help understand um, the most effective ways of managing it, and so we work very closely with those scientists and the NGOs and our different local organizations. Um, and so we have 78 collaborators, and underneath this little thing here, I think it says, yeah, 62 students. So, you know, you're part of a really big um, network of students, both here at FIU and across these other institutions. Gulf of Mexico and completely modified 
those coastal reaches and the ways in which we manage freshwater flows, right, um, through the projects that are occurring um, all the way up through the north of Lake Okeechobee, right, the whole comprehensive Everglades restoration program and the actions that affect water flows into the uh, confines of, of Everglades National Park. And again, we really um, strive at the what we call co-production of knowledge um, through the uh, interactions and collaborations that we have with uh, folks who are um, whose whose roles are to really affect the um, the management and operations of the kinds of actions that matter for our future. And so uh, we do work in what we call this kind of collaboration space between the practitioners and the academic realm in order to really make sure that that science is feeding effectively into management and that we're informed um, by the practitioners of the important um, questions that need to be addressed for effective management. And so the different um, kind of areas that we focus on have quite a bit of overlap with those five core areas that John talked about for all of LTER. Um, we have these sort of things that we study along these gradients uh, from the freshwater Everglades all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. And those include the biogeochemistry of the water, the primary productivity of the producers, the organic matter dynamics, particularly the dissolved organic and particulate organic um, carbon movements and sources and, and um, quality. And then also the dynamics of our food webs and the consumers and the ecosystem. And uh, we synthesize the studies across those different kind of core areas through um, thematic research uh, on topics such as hydrology and water policy, the fate and sources of carbon and the ecosystem. Again, this uh, facet of social ecological legacies, um, because we know how important they are in driving what we see on the landscape. And um, then we work with a, a whole bunch of different kinds of ecological and social models so that we can um, help envision different kinds of futures uh, that are uh, um, populated by the kinds of data that we collect. Uh, throughout the ecosystem, both over long-term long -term studies and through uh, sort of mechanistic experiments that oftentimes are the subject of, of a lot of our students in the program. Um, our research sites are arrayed from the freshwater plates down through uh, the marine um, areas all the way down into the Gulf of Mexico, and so we have these gradients along the Sharp River Slough, that's the major drainage in the central Everglades, and the Taylor Slough, a smaller drainage that comes through the Gulf of Mexico and out into the marine. Um, you can see these arrows here are meant to represent those uh, confluences of water flows, right, from the freshwater and the marine. And so we think of the Everglades as the place that's really kind of caught the balance of these two pressures. And it's the balance of those pressures that are really going to um, determine our future. Um, so just a little overview of our sites for those of you that haven't been out there yet. Um, we have uh, sites distributed across the ridge and slough. That's our um, freshwater uh, part of the Everglades down through whoop, weird, um, our mangrove forest, which contains some of the most productive forests on the whole planet. And um, whoa, uh, the estuaries and meadows of our uh, Florida Bay and the coastal estuary areas. Um, and so a little bit about discoveries um, through the history of the program in a very, very um, short summary. I mean, it seems to be so in the way. I'm going to get rid of it. It's going to be in the way. Huh? Drag. Oh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Sorry, there it is. Okay, so um, this is a nice little graphic that uh, we had an artist help us put together because it's, um, 
you know, when you, uh, the, when you think of the Everglades as this really complex system, like we showed you those pictures from the freshwater marshes down to the mangroves. There's a lot of different elements, right? And then um, there's not just a lateral kind of element, but also a vertical one that really matters to this ecosystem, um, which is that connection with the groundwater. So underneath the Everglades, we have um, limestone that's super, super porous and just lets water in and out very easily. And uh, over the years, we've really come to recognize that importance of that connection uh, in driving the um, kinds of changes in the ecosystem that we've observed through our data sets. So um, this diagram is just showing the freshwater supply from upstream into, and this uh, depiction here, the Sharp River Slough and Taylor Slough here on the right, and the marine water pressure from the other side. Um, and it's also showing you a little bit about the productivity gradients along these transects. So what we found is that um, we have really, really oligotrophic marshes in that upper freshwater end of the system because there's not a lot of phosphorus in this ecosystem. Phosphorus is the limiting nutrient in the Everglades. It's very easily absorbed on the carbonate rock and um, therefore really is the controlling element of plant productivity. And so we have um, kind of low stature meadows um, with, with paraphyton communities that are in there as well that seem to thrive under that low phosphorus setting. And then as you get closer to the coast, um, we actually have these, these forests that I mentioned are among the most productive on the planet. Well, so one of the driving questions of our program for very many years has been, what is the source of coastal ecosystem productivity? That's a super generalized question that can be addressed anywhere, and in the Everglades is the super interesting one because, because we see patterning that isn't um, reflective of, of the kind of patterning that we find in estuaries and other parts of the world or in estuaries that you read about in textbooks. And that's because the supply of phosphorus is actually not coming from upstream like it is in every other estuary, most other estuaries in the world. It's coming from the Gulf of Mexico because those upstream marshes are so incredibly depleted. And so it's that constant bathing of the coastal marshes with of tidal water that's full, of, well, it's not really full of phosphorus, it's still very low concentration phosphorus water, but but it's a little bit more phosphorus than you have in the upstream. And because of that constant bathing by the, by the tidal um, in washing of, of nutrients, you have that little bit of fertilization that's coming um, to the coastal marshes and causes our forests to be so productive. And that nutrient is coming not only um, from the water flowing you know, above ground in the tides, but also from underground through this process of brackish groundwater movement to the, to, the, to the interior. And we see that over in the Taylor Slough as well, but we have all of Florida Bay intervening between the Gulf of Mexico and these um, shorter stature mangrove forests in Taylor Slough. And so um, what is happening, we're finding in Florida Bay is that the water is actually moving underground the whole way across and coming up into the um, into those brackish marshes where those dwarf mangrove trees are and they're able to get down to it um, with a very complex root system underneath. So that's a, in a nutshell, a lot of what we've learned in the past um, 18 or so years of, of the LPR network. There's so much more than that, but that's a, a I mean, the FCE network. Um, there's, there's so much to that um, idea of what we call the FCE's upside down estuary. So, and a lot written about this. So when we think about the possible futures for the FCE, um, we have to, again, return to that idea that the system is really caught in the balance of this freshwater and marine supplies, right? And so right now we have a lack of freshwater flows and um, a huge pressure from the marine and with sea level rising at rates faster than we've ever seen in the past or than we've seen in past history of the Everglades. And in the most recent 10 years, we're seeing rates up to um, 
10 millimeters a year, which is higher than the rest of the globe is seen. So uh, we have a real problem here, right? Because that salt is coming in further into the interior and bringing with it phosphorus and really affecting productivity along the coastal zone. So the future of the system, we're not going to affect the rate of sea level rise by a trade. Um, sea is, the sea is going to continue to evade, it's going to continue to bring salt and phosphorus. But we can affect that freshwater head, okay? And Chamelis over there has done a lot of work on calculating um, the difference between that freshwater head and the marine pressure, which gives us a really good sense of where the system is um, relative to what we do with freshwater management. And we can model that and think about possible futures um, under restored freshwater deliveries that um, may help mitigate the pressures of, of sea level rise. So um, just a few details about our different working groups. So I'm going to show you eight or ten slides um, summarizing what we've learned um, with just little snippets of what we've learned from the different working groups, okay? And I've also put a little picture in the corner representing one of our students from each of these groups, but like I said, we've got 62 current students, probably a lot more um, since I took that number off the website a couple of weeks ago. Um, and over the years, we've had, you know, always had that many, right? So there have been tons of students in this program generating lots of information. So here's a little picture of David Lagosino, who is one of our main crisis students, and continuing to work as a, as a postdoc in the network with. Um, but what, what we're showing here is one of the, um, from one of the publications that Rennie's lab did, uh, showing the change in salinity contours over time, and you can see in the lower graphic here, the increase in salinity and water level happening in these sites that are kind of caught in that balance of the sea level rising and not having enough fresh water delivery, right? So we are seeing really rapid rates of saltwater intrusion. And Chamelis has a recent paper on this that you can read that really summarizes that quite well. Um, so, as I mentioned, this, the delivery of salt into the sea system is really highly tied to the delivery of phosphorus in a lot of different ways. Not only are they sourced from the same place, the Gulf of Mexico, um, but when the salt moves through the rock, it's also picking up phosphorus from the bedrock and desorbing it and bringing it into the water. And so these are the kind of data that are out there for you guys to be thinking about using, okay? Our database has lots and lots of numbers like this showing long-term trends, and this is hard to find anywhere else, right? 20 years of water quality data showing the fluctuations in things like nitrogen, carbon, phosphorus. And these are, are the phosphorus data here. Um, showing increases uh, in some of our sites, particularly those sites closest to the source of the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, long-term increases going on. Those increases are punctuated by these big storm events that come through and deliver great big globs of mud from the Gulf of Mexico heavily laden with phosphorus. Um, one of the changes that we're observing in the coastal marshes is a loss of the historic peat soils. So most of our Everglades wetlands are accreting peat, right? Their plants are growing and they're dying and they're accumulating um, organic soils. And um, those soils in some parts of the system build at rates that are equivalent to sea level rise, and in other places they don't. And that would be particularly true of our freshwater marshes that are not used to seeing salt and they're building peat fairly slowly. But when they're exposed to salt, we're finding that that peat soil actually not only stops building, but begins to break down. And we had observed that in, in parts of the system and um, over the last five or six years or so have been doing lots of different experiments to play around with salt exposure um, and phosphorus exposure and both of those together to see what happens with um, the sawgrass peaks and the sawgrass plants themselves. And so we document things like elevation, steep elevation changes that occur, um, reductions in the amount of fixed carb carbon fixation that's going on, and um, trying to get at the root of what is happening with those um, 
the sawgrass marshes and what might their fate be in the future under different um, settings of water management and sea level rise. Um, I mentioned peak accretion, and so uh, you know while the sawgrass marshes in some places are really losing elevation, um, we have mangrove marshes that historically have been um, building peat soils really, really fast. Okay, they're really productive and they're making a lot of roots, and those roots die and they build, and build, and build. Um, and mangroves are really, really good at keeping up with the pace of sea level rise. They're stimulated by the phosphorus associated with that tidal water, and uh, they, they build up those soils, but uh, there comes a point when salinity exposure exceeds their own tolerance to um, excrete salt and um, becomes a stressor for them. Um, with added uh, saltwater intrusion, you not only get more salt, but you get deeper water and sometimes longer inundation periods, and that can also reduce the productivity of mangrove trees. And so we're finding in some of our sites, these are um, just accretion data from some of the work that Josh Breitrup, the student over at the University of South Florida, um, developed from sediment cores showing that um, the accretion rates that we're finding in the sediment cores are actually quite a bit lower than this very high rate of sea level rise that we're experiencing in the system right now. And that's pretty alarming um, because it means that our, our elevation building is not um, keeping up with the rate of, of relative elevation loss as the sea comes up. So um, this change in the pulsing of water in and out of our ecosystem is not only affecting plants and biogeochemistry and the dynamics of groundwater, but it's also affecting our animals, and we study this from the smallest to the largest. Um, and some of our charismatic species include these guys, right, the sharks and the gators and the snook. And um, we have a lot of these fish tagged with little satellite tags, and whenever um, they swim past the sensor, we know exactly where they are in the ecosystem so that we can um, track those movements of individual fish and learn a lot about behaviors and learn a lot about their dynamics relative to uh, water supplies. And we do a lot of studies of what they're eating as well. We study their stable isotopes. We study uh, the food in their guts um, to try to figure out how they are um, changing in response to these different supplies of carbon that come in and out of our system with all the changes going on. And that's Ross Bouchette, who I mentioned before, who had led um, quite a few network level studies as part of this PhD. Um, so to get into a couple of the themes that we've been focusing on at least over the last six years, um, one of them is the source and, and fate of carbon, what's going on with carbon across the Everglades ecosystem. Um, we have lots of different ways of measuring that, including um, at, the, at the plot scale where you're actually out and counting plants and measuring them. And, and tagging them, um, but also using things like flux towers that measure the rate of exchange of carbon in and out of the forest. And when we bring all of those values together, um, we can come up with things like a net ecosystem carbon balance. That's the amount of carbon that is being stored, uh, brought into the ecosystem. And um, and that ecosystem exchange is a number reflecting how much energy, how much um, carbon is coming in and out of the ecosystem. And you can see here that our mangrove forest is, uh, has very high values, our marsh is highly variable depending on whether it's flooded or not. And um, this is really exciting because it gives us a sense of, of sort of baseline for the system that we can use to understand possible or model possible futures. And um, a, a couple of folks have been working on evaluating the, um, the sort of net worth of, of the carbon in the system in terms of how to create the economy. And, and we've got four billion dollars of, of carbon in that. <laughs> um, 
Then again, as I mentioned, we do a lot of modeling, particularly with our agency collaborators who are so concerned about different options of management for the best, best futures of, of the system. And uh, Hillary Flower is one of our students who work um, on the Everglades landscape model, looking at the future of peak in the ecosystem um, under different kinds of scenarios for the future of water management and, and sea level rise. And so um, just to wrap up, we um, are kind of in an exciting phase for the program because we have uh, restoration projects actually happening, right? We have a, a bridge. Um, that was constructed along the Canyon Trail to let more water in from the upper water conservation areas um, just a couple of years ago in a new bridge that's nearly completed. Um, so that's exciting along the northern boundary of the Sharp River Slough. And then projects along the eastern boundary to try to retain more water into uh, the Taylor Slough um, are have been leaking out the eastern boundary uh, due to the canal system. And now they're filling canals and trying to keep that water to the interior to allow more flow um, through the Taylor Slough and in the flow bay. So it's an exciting time. Um, we are again really keen on helping you guys learn about ways to not only do fantastic science in this uh, critically changing ecosystem, but also how to communicate those changes to policymakers um, for effective decision making, to advance effective decision making. And so we do things like um, we have uh, Senator Bob Graham, former Senator Bob Graham has a center focused on this um, up at University of Florida. He's come down to work with um, our grad students on, on ways of working directly with your legislators um, to convey the results of the science that we learned. Um, we got to meet President Obama, who said really important things like, this is not a problem for your generation, it's a problem for ours, and we need to fix it now. He wants his kids to be able to come down and see the Everglades the way he sees it. So, um, exciting stuff going on, and boy, are there so many opportunities for you guys in this program. And you will get everything you put into it out, and then some, okay? So I just really encourage you to be as engaged as you possibly can. There is just so much opportunity here and it's affected the lives of so many of our students and the careers of so many of our students to be involved. The more involved you are, the bigger the difference is going to make.